Welcome to everybody. And uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is Ruth Langer, and I am the interim director of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning at Boston College and a professor in the theology department. We want to welcome you to our first event of this academic year, now that the Jewish holidays are over. And this is a talk by our visiting Corcoran chair, Dr. Jesper Svartvik, titled Good Friday or Bad Friday. Uh, before we get started, a note about our Zoom etiquette. We ask that you do please keep yourselves muted and post any questions that might arise in the chat as we go along. Uh, the moderators will then relay them to our speaker. I want to offer special thanks to those who are working behind the scenes, uh, to especially our center's associate director, Dr. Camille Markey, and our technical assistant and my doctoral student, Sam Jai. This event is being recorded in speaker view, which we encourage you to use as well. And it will be publicly available on our website and our social media shortly. Uh, Sam, I think we can take down the welcome slide, please. If you are uncomfortable being recorded, you are of course more than welcome to turn off your camera, but especially when we get to discussion afterwards, it'll be fun to see everybody's faces. Usually the Corcoran chair professor is welcomed with an in-person lunch and an initial talk. Uh, but unfortunately, Professor Svartvik is stuck in Sweden. He's a prisoner of the pandemic still. And we have hopes that he will soon be able to get his visa and join us in Boston. In the interim, we have the benefit of being able to welcome Many of you friends from around the world, I see people from as far as Israel, some people, people from Europe, people from the West Coast. Uh, and that's also an advantage that we have because of the pandemic. Uh, feel free, of course, if this is your lunchtime to eat lunch while you're listening, or if this is your supper time, obviously supper too. Now to our speaker. Jesper Svartvik holds a doctorate in New Testament studies from Lund University, where he held the Christer Stendhal Chair of Theology of Religions. His areas of expertise include New Testament studies, interreligious relations in general, and Jewish Christian relations in particular. Dr. Svartvik is the single author of 12 books and co editor of four more, most of which focus on or have significant implications for issues raised by Christian Jewish dialogue. These include his newly published book, the topic of today's talk called Reconciliation and Transformation, Reconsidering Christian Theologies of the Cross. And a link to this will be placed in the chat. Um, I received this book last Thursday and spent the weekend immersed in it energized with thoughts raised by it that swirl around in my head in response to its important challenges. Uh, and so we're really very much looking forward to having those challenges brought to this wider community here today. After Dr. Svartvik's presentation, we'll be honored by a brief response by Dr. Svartvik's longtime friend and dialogue partner, Rabbi Dr. Kar Tamara Kohn Eskenazi, the Effie -E Wise Ox Professor of Biblical Literature and History at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. And so now we turn the Zoom microphone over to our speaker, Dr. Svartvik. Thank you. Before addressing the topic for this talk, allow me first to express my deep gratitude to Boston College for the opportunity to serve as the holder of the Corker and the sitting chair, and to my colleagues Ruth Langer and Camille Markey for inspiring cooperation, stimulating conversation. It's indeed a great honor for me to present this book at Boston College, one of the leading universities in the field of theology, divinity, religious studies, 
And I'm delighted to see that so many join us today as we address the topic of reconciliation and transformation. The topic for today is Good Friday or Bad Friday. Although the day of the death of Jesus of Nazareth in the Christian world is known as Good Friday, for Jews it has certainly been a bad Friday. The Via Dolorosa, the way of Jesus to the cross, has for the Jewish people in the Christian world during Holy Week been a path of pain and pogroms. Christian theologies of the cross have provoked a distinctly Christian form of anti-Semitic blame discourse known as the so-called deicide charge, i.e. that Jews all over the world in all times are being accused of having murdered God. Hence the cross event and Christian atonement theology have played important role in anti-Jewish apologetics, antagonism and animosity. It's certainly tragic, it's ironic that the event that is said to be the criterion, the decisive factor atonement keeps creating acrimony. Hence, it's altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, we at the Center for Christian Jewish Learning, who host this program on Christian theologies of the cross. So was it then a Good Friday or a Bad Friday? Even a small book such as this one that consists of merely some 150 pages contains many references to other books and articles. And I was preparing, and as I was preparing for this talk, I started thinking what other texts were the most important when writing reconciliation and transformation. And there are of course many, but if I had to choose only two, it would be one written by Moshe Halbetal called On Sacrifice. And one by Darren Snyder Belusek called Atonement, Justice and Peace. Typically, I dare say, the one book written by a Jew and the other by a Christian. After all, it is the center for Christian Jewish learning that hosts this event. Both books were published in 2012, and I bought them in Chicago at the annual meeting of the Society for Biblical Literature and the American Academy of Religion. And I remember reading Halbertal's book on sacrifice on the flight back to Scandinavia. And his this insistence on korban, often translated as sacrifice or offering, as something that brings us closer to God. There are many related words. Those of you who know Hebrew know this. Likrov, to approach. Lehikareb, to bring close. Lehakriv, to carry forward. Lehitkareb, to come near. Bukarov, soon, uh, etc., etc. So I'm convinced that when the first generations of Christ believers express their conviction that, as Paul calls it, God was in Christ reconciling the world to him, this was a way for them to formulate that those who used to be far away from God, the God of Israel, i.e. the Gentiles, now were covenantally embraced by the God of Israel. But not only was Christ the korban, the offering that brought the Gentiles closer to God, the Gentiles too were a korban. And we see this in the writings of Paul, the earliest layer of Christian writings in the New Testament. The temple is a reality that he can refer to rhetorically in a positive way in his arguments. And he compares himself to a priest in the temple who brings forth the Gentiles as an offering, korban, that is well-pleasing to the God of Israel. He writes about this in Romans chapter 15. And Halbertal's book helped me discern this discourse in the early Christian writings. The second book was written by Darren Snyder Belushek, Atonement, Justice and Peace, The Message of the Cross and the Mission of the Church. This is, as you saw, a big book. It contains more than 600 pages. It took me an entire vacation to read and ponder it. And he writes in the preface to carefully, he wishes to, carefully examine the assumed worldview or paradigm that has framed theology of the cross within the evangelical stream of Protestant Christianity and the majority tradition of Western Christianity in general. And he writes, the paradigm that understands retribution to be the son of justice and peace, as well as a substance of God and nature, end of quote. Belushek made me realize that the death of Jesus on Golgotha the Mount of Execution, so often is interpreted with the help of expressions such as 
God's justice demands or God's holiness requires. But on the other hand, that his teaching in Galilee, incidentally on another mountain, in the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount of the Sermon, is summarized in famous statements such as turning the other cheek, if someone compels you to go a mile, go with him twain, or loving one's neighbor as oneself, which of course is a quotation from the Torah. So why are the lessons learned from these two mounds so different in tone and tenor? I'm reminded of John Levinson's book on the two mountains in Jewish thought, Sinai and Zion. And do we have something similar here? I suggest the mountain in Galilee and the Mount of Golgotha. And what would happen if one took pains to articulate the cross event in the light of the teaching of Jesus, rather than putting his teaching in the shadow of the Mount of Execution. Quote, this is the real scandal, the stumbling block of the cross for most Christians. Our thinking about God's justice has not been transformed by the cross, but remains conformed to this world shaped by the scheme of this age, end of quote. This is a quotation from Belushek's impressive tome. And he questions the assertion that bloodshed is a necessary condition for reconciliation and draws attention to Hebrews 9.22, chapter 9, verse 22. Indeed, under the law, most everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And it concentrates on the word schedon, schedon katatonomon, almost everything according to the Torah which is not, he says, about defining the condition for atonement, but describing what is conventional. So Belashek consistently confronts and challenges claims that penal substitution, redemptive violence are embedded in the biblical text and therefore inescapably and inevitably biblical. Generally speaking, when Christ, conservative Christians keep insisting that redemptive violence is a necessary condition for atonement, many liberal Christians seem to dispatch gladly everything that has to do with sacrifices altogether with the Jewish scapegoat and Judaism, lightheartedly send them into the Judean desert, Lazazel. And the books by Halbertal and Belushek help me address those issues. There are concepts and expressions that are as a microcosm, as there are times when one can, as William Blake has taught us, see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. There are words that are like small worlds, an entire universe in themselves. And the Greek word, anexichiastos is such a word. Anexichniastos. It's apparently a Septuagintism stemming from the translation from Hebrew into Greek of the Hebrew Bible. We find it three times in the book of Job. The Hebrew words behind it uh, are the Ein Chekyet. It occurs twice in the New Testament, and Paul uses it in his famous doxology in Romans 11 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment, how inscrutable his ways. And we also find it in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, where the author describes the news of the boundless riches of Christ. One could say that in the book of Job, the word is used when describing creation and the unfathomable nature of God. In the epistle to the Ephesians, it refers to the revelation in Christ. And finally, in the 11th chapter, in Paul's epistle to the Romans, it's used in an eschatological context, referring to redemption. Hence, the word is used in three biblical texts about creation, revelation, and future redemption. The word consists of the alpha privativum, the alpha that comes before uh, the, the main word, and it becomes an before a vowel. And then we have the additional prefix ex, like in exodus. And then we have the essential part, which is ichnos, meaning footprint or trace. Hence, the word refers to something that is untraceable, fathomless, 
immeasurable, incalculable, invaluable, incomprehensible, inscrutable, et cetera, et cetera. Something which may be experienced, but never fully explored. It can be discerned, but never determined. Ephesians 3 uses the expression to mysterion tes oikonomias, the plan of the mystery, in a way that for centuries will echo in the writings of the church fathers. The word oikonomia or economia eventually becomes the technical term for the church fathers' theological explorations about God's entire interaction with creation. But this interaction is not, and this is emphasized by the anonymous author of the epistle of Diognetus, it is not as one may suppose, as humans might suppose. So they say the oikonomia, the way of God's interacting with this world is unfathomable, but it's also surprising. It's not something that one can calculate. Now, given the to mysterion teis oikonomias refers not only to the death of Jesus, but to the entire, what theologians call Christ event. The sarcosis, i.e. the incarnation, anastasis, the resurrection. Then this is surprising in the sense that it is unforeseen, unpredicted, unanticipated, unexpected, and a number of other uns as well. And it's quite remarkable then that his death so often in theological treatises is described with the help of necessity, as if oikonomia meant economy. Uh, in the sense of bookkeeping with rules and regulations, with debits and credits, as if God were a cosmic banker, to use Greg Garrett's expression, or a stock exchange divinity, to use the phrase by Edward Irving. It's not a matter of economy in the sense of accounting, nor transaction, but of transformation, according to the Church Fathers. In the words of Colin Gunton, quote, not here some grim balancing of accounts, but rejoicing in a liberation. The Son of God has given himself to be where we are so that we might be where he is, participants in the life of God. And corresponding to that gift is the complete self-giving that is required, but likewise as a free and glad response. I appeal to you, therefore, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, korban, holy and acceptable to God, end of quote. And he ends with a quotation from Paul, Romans 12. So I believe that the word, the Greek word day, uh, it is necessary, which plays an important role in the New Testament Gospels, should not be understood as it is logical, i.e. rational, reasonable, commonsensical, but it is essential. That's the difference between commonsensical and essential, crucial, if you like. It is beneficial for humanity and the world. And when Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.9 famously paraphrases Isaiah 64.4, he describes his deepest conviction. What no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, and the heart of the matter, that is anexichiastos, that it is unfathomable. In addition, at variance with early Christian theology is the emphasis on the death of Jesus, in which the dialectics of Good Friday and Easter Day in early Christian thought is eclipsed. In the words of the Armenian theologian Vigen Guroyan, quote, if one presses the logic of this contemporary piety of the cross, the resurrection becomes unnecessary, for on Holy Friday Jesus accomplishes all that was needed in order that humankind might inherit eternal life. Ironically, this piety of the cross could not have come about but for the early church's conviction that the resurrection is indeed the culmination of the passion story. So in short, my understanding is based on three un. First, the anastasis, the importance of the resurrection in early Christian thought. We see it in the New Testament, we see in the writings of the church father, and that Good Friday not be separated from Easter day, a thought that has been developed and cherished more in the Christian traditions in the East than in the West. This emphasis on anastasis. And the second emphasis here is on anachronism, that the importance of seeking to understand korbanot, sacrifices, offering, as they were understood by the first Christians. 
Uh, I've learned a lot here from a scholar called Uluchi and his writings. And then the third word began, beginning with an an is the Greek word anexichiastos. The importance of recognizes that God's essence, God's usia in Greek is unfathomable. And as Paul writes in Romans, once again, how inscrutable are God's ways. So was it then a good Friday or a bad Friday? Well, one thing is certain, it can never be a good Friday if the ways in which Christians think and teach and preach and act actually promote anti-Judaism. Then it is a bad Friday and it remains a bad Friday for the Jew first and also for the Greek, to use Paul's expression. But in what way then can it become a good Friday? Rather than seeking to prove the rationale for the crucifixion, as if that were the Alpha and Omega of Christian theology, should we not hint at the ways in which God acts also in the midst of despair? It reminds me of the words ascribed to Eric Little, Scottish gold medalist running in Paris in 1924, a missionary portrayed in one of my favorite movies, Chariots of Fire. Quote, circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. God's love is still working. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. End of quote. Rav Soloveitchik, in 1956, in Koldo di Dofek, a uh, uh, quotation from Shia Shirin from uh, Song of Songs 5.2, he distinguishes between fate and destiny. Goral, the passive covenant of slavery, versus Yehud, the active covenant of Sinai. Of, of Sinai. And the passive ask, person asks, he says, why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve this? That's the fatum in Latin. But the act of this challenge, and the challenge is to transform fate into destiny. And similarly, in his book, Holy Week Preaching, Christus Stendhal writes that the emphasis should be on the consequences of the events. Quote, the mood is finality and not causality, as is so often in the scriptures and in the teaching of Jesus, and I quote. Questions that emphasize causality, that's fate. Focus on what led to the death of Jesus. And New Testament scholars even have an expression for this, crucifiability, that they look for the reason for Jesus being crucified. What did they do then and there? But those who emphasize finality, destiny, that's the word of uh, Rab Soloveitchik, investigate the consequences of his death. What does this mean for those who want to live as his disciples? In other words, he suggests that readers not ask so often why as what for, not so often whens as whither. What are the consequences of Christians' Good Friday theologies? Where do they take us? When Christians come to the foot of the cross of Jesus, says Rosan Catalano, they need a piety that honors God and all those whom God loves. And this is how I suggest that we transform bad Friday theologies into good Friday theologies. I trust you have already perceived that I find these critical questions about the crucifixion important, crucial, if you like. I realize that not everyone uh, agrees with me here, but I hope that we all acknowledge that cross theologies have consequences. And the very first step must be to recognize that we know the tree by its fruit, as the Gospels of Matthew and Luke teach us. Readers of the New Testament cannot forswear the consequences of what they believe and teach. It would be unworthy of the followers of him who washed his disciples' feet to imitate him who washed his hands. I leave you with this thought. Thank you for joining us today at this virtual book release at the Center for Christian Jewish Learning at Boston College. And I hand over the microphone to my colleague, Ruth Langer. And I hand it over to our colleague, Tamara Cohn-Eskenazi.
Thank you. I'm going to be very brief. Thank you so much for the presentation and for this truly amazing book that we are launching today. I remember very vividly what it felt like when as a Jewish graduate student focusing on the New Testament, I first read Krista Stendhal's book, Paul Among Jews and Gentiles. It felt as if a window opened suddenly and a reviving wind came through and suddenly a millennia of things that have gone wrong began to be addressed and redressed. I felt the same way reading this book. Um, this book that speaks about reconciliation and transformation, but not only speaks about them, but models them. And so to read it is to be part of a process of uh, reconciliation and transformation. It is transforming for me as a Jew, an academic and a rabbi to witness how what has been such a divisive, destructive feature of Jewish Christian relations can in fact be an opportunity for repositioning the dialogue in ways that include other relations and other religions. The theologies of the cross and its multifaceted symbolism as this book presents them are themselves a revelation, a genuine revelation. They make possible a genuine recognition even sharing of the anguish that both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament respond to. This theologies that this book emphasizes deepen appreciation and chart a path of how to move beyond such anguish in the history of animosity to a healing partnership towards a different kind of relation. So I can only be very grateful to have this book that I can now share with colleagues, students, Jews and Christians and, uh, and learn from. And so thankful to you, Jasper, for making it all possible. Thank you so much for your wonderful, generous words, Tamara. Uh, and thank you so much to, um, to Jesper for this introduction that in a few minutes opened up some of the major themes of the book. Uh, at the same time, it left a lot unsaid. Uh, and let me invite you, there's been inv invitations coming in the chat from uh, from Sam, but please let me invite you to uh, voice uh, your questions in the chat uh, rather than speaking out. I mean, you have that capability, but we're trying to, uh, it will be, be better for everybody if, if we relay the questions through the chat. I'm wondering while we're waiting for that, Jesper, whether you would, might want to pick up on one of the themes that you mentioned um, Particularly, I think this question of owning the destiny of the cross and share with us how that might be concretized in a Christian community today. Thank you. And thank you, Tamara, uh, for your generous words. Um, the destiny of the cross. I began as a, a Markan scholar. I wrote my thesis uh, on the Gospel of Mark. I was interested in the genre Evangelion, since no one had written anything similar to that before he put his pen to the paper and, and, and started writing Acheto Evangelio. This is the beginning of the Gospel. But Paul had written letters uh, decades before Mark wrote his. If Paul wrote in the 50s, Mark wrote his gospel in the 70s. And Paul uh, often addresses the issue of the finality of the cross, the consequences. As I said in my introduction here, 
and I, I repeat it in all my writings, that he thought that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus was the way for God to embrace covenantally the Gentiles. So those who were far away were now brought forth as a korban, as a sacrifice, as an offering to God. That seems to be the major team, the theme. That, that's the alpha and omega of Paul's theology. So he takes this, uh, what happened in Jerusalem, as the, the beginning of something new, that God does something new in and through the life and death and resurrection of, of Jesus. And Mark seems to be saying the same thing. I am one of those scholars who argue that there is a connection between Paul and Mark, as there are between John and the Johannine uh, epistles, and uh, between Luke and Acts, and etc. So I think there's a connection between Mark and Luke, but but Mark and and Paul. But what Mark does is that since he he chose this genre to tell a story, a narrative that commences with the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist and continues up until the death of Jesus and the empty tomb, there is a, a shift of focus from finality to causality. And not so much because he wanted to emphasize this, because I think that's the much more important for the church fathers and for Christians later on to understand why it happened. They simply say, they, it was necessary, it was essential that this happened. But I, I think that um, here Paul helps us. We should read the Gospels with Pauline glasses, so to speak, to emphasize much more on the finality and going from the Gospels into uh, the wisdom of those who have... Uh, coached and listened to people, uh, uh, anguished people, anxiety, uh, that to, to, to help us, help each other to focus not so much on why this happened, the fatum, the fate, but much more to, to go forward, to look forward, to see what possibilities do we have here. And that's why I enjoyed, uh, uh, why I chose to read the, this quotation from Eric Liddell, that God is not restless in the ruins, that, that sometimes our life are ruined, but that to see that there are possibilities. And indeed, I think of uh, Judaism and Christianity in antiquity, both as post-traumatic religions. They, they, they had to cope with the, for, the destruction of the temple year 70. And I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of texts were written uh, both in the Jewish and Christian tradition after 70 CE. Both the, the oral tradition that became the Mishnah was written down and the Gospels were written 70, 75, 80, 85, 90 something because they had to cope with that, uh, the Khurban Habayit, the, the destruction of uh, the temple. Um, so that's how I, I see it. And so I think the question of causality, finality is essential uh, and it helps us when we read the New Testament. Those were just a few few spontaneous remarks. How does this come to affect Jewish-Christian uh, relations? Well, certainly one aspect of it is that, that we have to realize that what we say uh, has consequences. What I said towards the end of my speech that uh, we, we know the true tree by its fruit. So anti-Jewish uh, sermons, teaching, uh, books, Bible studies, etc., paradigms, indeed paradigms, uh, have consequences. And Christians need to realize that. Uh, uh, so that's, that's of, of course, one, one way of talking about the, the, the consequences here, uh, that what we do, what we say, what we teach, what we preach, uh, all that, uh, it has consequences. That's one spontaneous comment, once again. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm asking to concretize that. I'm also asking that our audience join in and, uh, and join the conversation uh, through the chat. But if you would like to raise your hand, we can also handle that. Your virtual hand. 
Tamara has already uh, presented the book in her uh, wonderful, generous way. Uh, I could add that one chapter was actually uh, a, a chapter in the first trip to her well, on her 29th birthday uh, a, a couple of years ago. And it's uh, chapter seven, rendering the rending of the veil. So that's one example of how I, how I work, how I do theology, how I write, that I feel that the rending of the veil, veil you may know this, that it says in the gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at least, that the, 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 the veil was torn uh, into, into two halves. And how has that been interpreted? And I suggest three words, three emotions that some re react with wrath, that how uh, God had to do this because of what the Jews did. And then we have another reaction, which is uh, uh, joy, that thanks to the death of Jesus, we are now forgiven. That's the entire second line of thought. And I th thought that not so much wrath, not so much joy, but uh, sorrow, grief. That's how I think that early Christians thought of Good Friday, more of, as a yard site than, than as a cause for celebration. Easter Day, there's something completely different. But Good Friday within the, the matrix of early Christianity would be uh, grief. And I suggest, I'm not the first one to suggest this, but nevertheless, I, I, I wanted to write it, that I think of it as, uh, as the tearing of the clothes that a mourning person does. And that this is God's way of showing grief, tearing the veil, tearing the clothes. Uh, so that's how I understand it. So that's one, maybe one could call it the Midrashic reading of the stories. Uh, if not historical, at least it is a, a way of interpreting them that makes sense uh, and has implications, positive implications, I might add, for Jewish Christian relations. Now I do believe that we have a few questions. We do have a few questions in the chat. And let's begin with a question from Michael Azar. He says, the book description emphasizes the role of theosis uh, in the book, but that didn't come up too much in today's overview. Can we hear more about how theosis factors into your book? Right. So uh, as uh, Ruth mentioned, I worked for 10 years in Jerusalem. And of course, I learned a lot from uh, uh, the dialogue with uh, Jews and Muslims, but also for me as someone uh, being born and raised in Sweden, uh, being a Lutheran minister, I learned a lot from uh, the encounter with the Eastern tradition. And to use this, the, the Greek word theosis here, uh, I don't know, uh, recall now what you say in, in English. Uh, did, uh, theosis, uh, I think, yeah. Yes, some, theosis. And, and th I found that very helpful, that it is the, uh, the sarcosis, the uh, incarnation, the resurrection, anastasis, and becoming what, what God is, that uh, God became man so that man could become uh, divine, that those are the three uh, stepping stones in the, the Greek words, but we find them all over uh, the Orthodox um, um, uh, tr or, uh, everywhere in the Orthodox tradition, I, I might believe. And I find that so helpful that the Good Friday isn't isolated from those three major key words. The, uh, Good Friday isn't removed from it, but it, it's always related, uh, sorry, it's not removed, it, it's always there. It's connected to those major three words. Um, so that, uh, there is more to say here, uh, but, but I, I wanted to acknowledge how much I learned from Orthodox theology and emphasis on sarcosis, anastasis, and theosis here. Good, great. Um, a question from Lillian Apart Apartheker, uh, who's joining us from France, probably, or elsewhere in Europe. Um, an understanding of suffering is often at the heart of Christian of Jewish Christian relations. 
Jews are wounded people. Christians speak of the suffering of Christ as the essential suffering. And this often prevents deep dialogue. Is there, do you have thoughts on this? It prevents uh, deep dialogue, uh, certainly. Uh, because there has been so much suffering and people are still suffering from the consequences of what we say about each other, uh, about the other. Um, I have uh, the penultimate chapter, chapter eight, uh, deals with this topic. And for me, as I said, one encounter was uh, meeting Orthodox theology in Jerusalem. And one encounter, another encounter was with African American readings of the Good Friday, because th there has, in that area, uh, suffering is never romanticized, never ever, I would say. And therefore it helped me a lot to, to see how both early, um, uh, African-American spirituality and contemporary, how they, they deal with this. Uh, so there is a, a, never a comparison, I would say, but much more of uh, identification. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen but Jesus because he has been suffering. So, so he knows what I am going through. So, so I would uh, say that the eighth chapter uh, that is where I address these issues. Uh, suffering can prevent dialogue, but we can also see that we have so many texts. We have them in the Psalms, we have in the Passion narratives, that when you believe that God isn't there, nevertheless, in spite of Hestapanim and Simpson, somehow there is still an opportunity for people to relate to God in spite of all this. And there we can be uh, partners uh, uh, in sharing what we have experienced. But it should never be, as I said, comparison. It's not a matter of comparisons, but identification. And what I find problematic are the three A's of uh, Anselm, uh, Abelar, and the Swede Aulin, that they, they all instrumentalize violence, not all of them as much, not only as much as Ansem, certainly, but nevertheless, it, it is too much emphasis on, on violence. And if Jesus is understood as a korban, violence should not ever, ever, never ever should, should it play a, a role, because that is not part. If, if you go into that metaphor, violence is not the issue, but the korban is what, what you bring forth to God. A uh, slightly different direction, although I guess it's still picking up on this theme of violence at some levels. Um, Deb Schubach asks, what do you think about how the death of Jesus is paralleled or equivalent to the almost death of Isaac by Abraham? Um, and how does, I mean, this is a theme which has been written on extensively, it's important, but how does your work add new insights to this? I've written about it elsewhere. I don't have so much on the Akedah on Genesis 22 in this book, but I, I do believe that the Akedah was one, uh, it's a leitmotif of early Christian reflection on the death of Jesus. Uh, we find it in Hebrews. We find it perhaps even in uh, Swedish, we call it the, the, the little Bible, uh, John 3, 16. I don't know if there's such an expression of... Uh, in, in English, but that, uh, th that the father giving the son. And, and we also have in the Christian tradition, the same wrestling. Is it the, um, is it, was it never intended to happen? Was it good that it happened? Was it a, a trial? Was it an error? Uh, was it a misunderstanding? Uh, how old was um, Isaac? We don't have that particular uh, Midrash, I would say, in the New Testament, but since uh, the rabbis dis finally decided that he was 37, and given that Jesus was born perhaps seven years before our, before BCE, and uh, died in year 30, it's 
it's a uh, it triggers one's midrashic mind to think of him as an, an uh, Isaac figure in early Christian literature. So, so it's certainly there, uh, but I don't deal very much with it in, in this book, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, a question from uh, Francois Sarazin, per, uh, my apologies if I mispronounce your name. Are anti-Jewish readings of the passion a fallback to the scapegoating mechanism when the passion was in fact necessary to expose this mechanism from the inside, from the perspective of the victim, i.e. Jesus. Mark Heim's book, he's written articles about this and a major book, um, Saved from Sacrifice, I think. He, he, he is very close to this line of thought and uh, I agree with uh, a lot of what he writes in that book. Uh, so I, I recommend that if if not everyone has read it uh, already. So it, it, I, and I touched upon this that it's not so much that God has to go into our logic that the more violence the the better, but rather that we should go into God's way of thinking to to be removed from that. And that's what the uh, Paul writes about in Romans twelve that we should be transformed by the renewal of our thoughts so that we can, so we don't uh, adjust to this world. And it's not talking about 2021, but about uh, the Roman empire in, in which there was a lot of violence, uh, scapegoating, etc. I, of course, I, I mean, I think uh, Christian theology has overemphasized the scapegoat. That's only one part of the liturgy, but the, 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 the entire order uh, for Yom Kippur. Uh, and that has been, it's, it, the, 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 there are no proportions any longer. So when we say scapegoating, it, it, it doesn't refer to what we have in the book of Leviticus, I would say. Um, um, but certainly if we remove it as korban in modern Hebrew can mean victim. It doesn't mean that in, in biblical Hebrew, but it can mean it today. The same thing here. Yes, we need to be remove ourselves from scapegoating and not talking about Leviticus now, but our way of, of blaming and finding victims, etc. And that is the mechanism that I, I do believe that Mark Heim, um, uh, he, he shows the way. He says, do this in remembrance of me, share a meal, uh, meet together, pray together. Don't do that, he says, but do this. And he, he points finger to the Roman Empire. Don't do what they do, but do what we do here uh, when we celebrate the, the Seder. So that's something about scapegoating. Okay, a question from Philip Cunningham, a good friend and colleague of ours. Um, what are key strategies to get away from the notion that God needed to be paid back for the sins of humanity? Well, most explicit in substitutionary atonement theologies, especially in the United States, it also seems to be a concept in many theologies of the cross. Well, I come from a country in which the last capital punishment was executed, if that's what you do. Uh, the person, last person executed was in 1910, I believe. That's 111 years ago. And then they said, it's not allowed. And now it says in, in the law that it's even forbidden to do it. So it's stronger and stronger expressions. I know that situation is different in many states in the US. and. Uh, some of you may come from other uh, countries. I believe the only one executed in Israel was Eichmann in 1960, 60-61. But uh, I mean, for me, since I'm opposed to uh, capital punishment, it's, it's easy to, to have that as a starting point to say, since I don't believe th that that is a punishment, but a crime in society, in law, um, I, I then moved from what I convinced in society into theology and said, 
I uh, and say, I want to be as far removed as possible from any theology that seems to indicate that God would be in favor of capital punishment. I realize that that logic doesn't really uh, work in a society uh, where you have capital punishment and uh, if you are in favor of it, but at least that's how I, I think of it, that to, to let see that there is an interrelationship here between um, politics and theology. If I'm against capital punishment from Monday to Saturday, I can't go to church on Sunday and preach that Jesus had to die because of the sins of humanity. That, that's combining too many of, uh, too many motifs, I would say. Uh, to, to think of Jesus as a korban, that's one thing, as long as the temple uh, was there. Uh, and uh, Paul, as I said, uh, talks about it. But that has, ha, that's an, a, a different sphere that's a, a, going in another area. So I hope that that addressed some of uh, Phil Cunningham's uh, questions. What are the key strategies to get away from the notion that God needed to be paid back for the sins of humanity. Well, Anselm, as I see it, he wanted to uh, remove focus from the devil and said, we are theologians, so we want to have a focus on God. And therefore it became much more centered on the honor of God that had to be restored. I'm not suggesting that we go back to pre-Anselm uh, theology, but at least to to say that uh, the rachamim of God is not necessarily related to being, to be paid back. Not all parents are exemplary, uh, we know that, but if uh, rachamim and rechem are related, it's, so what would a, a parent do? And, and the parent's honor has been necessary perhaps to be restored in, in, in history, but we don't say that it's essential, that it has to be like that and that it is like that today. So that, that's how I would say that, yes, we need God's rachamim and chen and uh, chesed and, and all that, but that the criterion for that is not, as Phil Cunningham says here, uh, to be paid back. Those are a few, few reflections. In other words, you are opening a very, very complex topic that we, by challenging many of the established understandings that in many cases have chose to have, have been demonstrated to become poisonous or had the potential to be poisonous, um, that sets a challenge before everyone else to join with you in many ways in trying to figure out where the emphasis ought to be. What's the, what are alternative emphases? What are different directions going forward? What is, the, what is the pastoral response to this challenge in many cases? And the liturgical response. And uh, I think you've, you've set a, a really, um, provocative, eye-opening, and convincing challenge before the world with the work in the book. And there's much more in the book than could be conveyed in today's short lecture. Uh, and yet at the same time, um, this gives us a task going forward. And I hope that all of us will have the chance to join you in working towards the next books, which will be part of developing the answers to these challenges too, and figuring out more completely where it is that we can go and we can move as a community, as a community of Jews and of Christians, and as a community of human beings. So with that, I think that I would like to close the formal part of this program and to very much thank uh, Dr. Svartvik for his words of from his heart, his challenges to all of us, and to uh, Rabbi Dr. Tamara Kohn Eskenazi uh, for her 
beautiful response to Jesper's book also. So thank you very much. Please join me in applauding him, applauding both of them. And uh, if he is willing, I know it's later at night in Sweden than it is in the United States, um, to stay on and we can open the floor for person-to-person -person discussion at this point too.